What's going on, everybody? It's Monday. Time for Swift News. A quick reminder, I do put out Swift News on the podcast, iOS Dev Discussions, about a day or two after this airs, if you want to listen to it on the go. Another thing, I'm bringing back origin stories on the podcast, where I talk about how people got started in development this week. And the first guest on this new origin stories is John Sundell. So if you're wondering how he got into development and how he got started with the content creation, that's the episode for you. That is coming this week. Stay tuned. All right, let's get into the news. First up, we have an article from Tim Rosner about how to support dynamic type with custom fonts in iOS. Now, we've talked about dynamic type before, but I wanted to feature this one because it takes it a step further. Like a lot of articles I've seen and I've featured talk about how to actually do the dynamic type. But as Tim mentions uh, in this article, that's just the beginning of it. Um, we'll get to that. We'll get to that later. So here's the article. Tim, by the way, is on the iOS engineering team at Twitch. Uh, I've met him in person at WWDC, various meetups in San Francisco. Cool guy. So shout out to Tim. But here, he uh, obviously helped build dynamic type into Twitch. And you can see the various uh, font sizes there in the Twitch app. Uh, and he talks about how using UI font metrics, which is new as of iOS 11. He also talks about how Twitch now up their support to iOS 11. So looks like Twitch is supporting N minus two there, but uh, shows you how to use UI font metrics to scale your custom fonts. Talks about how they use an enum for their sizes, this function to you know make things nice. And I am kind of skimming over this because this is not meant to be a tutorial. Go read the article. Um, talks about how they created this size system that you'll see here, uh, extra small default XXL. And you can see the different uh, sizes that they created for the app. And I like how you can see them displayed so you can get a visual for how it's going to look. And then he talks about how you put all that into an extension on UI font. So you can just do UI font dot Twitch headline and you get you know what you're supposed to get. So that's how we implemented it. But again, we've talked about that before. What I really wanted to talk about here is this part here and now it says adding support for dynamic type is not where the work stops that's where it starts and basically as you can see you know when you're giving these giant fonts like your layout is going to change so tim goes on to talk about how you can adjust your labels number of lines zero adjust font for content size category true um, stack views how you can change your stack views from being horizontally stacked to vertically stacked based on the size and he gives a picture of it here right so you can see this little card right you see it's a horizontal stack view with the results button on the right and the text on the left well here on the right when the text gets really big that's no longer a horizontal stack view it flipped to a vertical stack view to account for the larger type so that's what we're talking about when you know just supporting dynamic type is just step one your layout's going to get all messed up when somebody has this giant type so now you got to go back in and reassess your layouts to make sure when somebody does have the giant type the app still looks good and is still usable. And he gives further examples here, table views, collection views, scroll views. Anyway, if you're interested in implementing dynamic type into your app, uh, take a look at this article by Tim Rosner of Twitch and how they did it there. And again, how just supporting dynamic type is just step one, then you gotta fix your layout. Next, we have an update to a very popular and, and kind of famous course in the Swift community, and that is the Stanford uh, iOS development course. Now, this course is released every year and it's evolved, right? It used to be an Objective-C, then it converted over to Swift and, and MVC. And now this year in 2020, they're switching over to Swift UI and MVVM. Now they've only released two of the videos, it looks like. Uh, so the first one is, you know, course logistics and introduction to Swift UI. And then lecture two is MVVM and the Swift type system. I assume more will be coming, but uh, again, this is the, uh, the very well-known Stanford course that many have taken over the years, now updated for Swift UI and MVVM. Check out the first two uh, lessons and be on the lookout for more in the coming weeks. Next up, we have the future of Swift on the server by Tim Condon, uh, talking all about how 2020 was the year of the server. Uh, you're gonna be seeing a lot more server-side Swift content in the coming months on my channel. Tim and I are working together on a consulting project where I'm finally gonna really dive into server-side Swift. I mean, he's gonna be building it, but I'm gonna get a front row seat into what's going on, you know? Uh, so uh, essentially what he's saying, well, let, let's start off. Let, let's put out the disclaimer. Uh, to be clear, he's not saying everything was and is perfect with Swift on the server. There, there's definitely issues. And he says this at the end, but I'll put it up front that like, keep in mind, 
in the, in the grand scheme of things, Swift, still a very young language. Swift on the server, still very early. So even though this article is talking about how things are looking great, things are going in the right direction, it's still good to keep the, uh, the perspective that we're still very early in this game. Uh, you know, it's cool to get excited about it, but like, it's early. So he goes on to talk about how the uh, On the Road to Swift 6, I did a video all about that, we featured that. Uh, it says rather than being a Swift 6 roadmap, he says it was essentially a Swift on the server roadmap. And I didn't really look at it from that perspective, because of course I'm, I'm not involved in Swift on the server at all, I've never used it, so it makes sense why I didn't think about that. But now that he points this out, and that's what this article is, him talking about all those points, I can see where he's coming from. Uh, so he says, every single goal of Swift 6 is either related to the server or has a direct benefit for it. Things like new OS support, uh, language server protocol improvement, you know, build times and dependency management, uh, the list goes on, all that stuff. Um, and two big pieces that uh, he feels are a great sign is the Swift core team got two new members, right? It, it's not every day that the core team gets new members. So this was a big deal. Uh, Tim Doran, who is responsible for Swift Neo, Swift Neo is what things like Vapor and, and Katura used to be uh, built on top of. Uh, and then also Salim uh, Abdurrasul, I'm sure I messed that up, I apologize, uh, who almost single-handedly has dragged Swift onto Windows. So what he says here is having both on the core team is signifying the importance of Swift outside the Apple ecosystem, like to the team. So uh, that's great to see. Again, we're still early, but it's nice to see the foundations being laid for Swift, like Tim says, outside the iOS, macOS ecosystem, right? And there's a lot of uh, things going on, uh, you know, more support for Linux distributions. To be honest with you, this is all getting into stuff that I don't really deal with or know much about. So I'm going to point you back to this article, read what Tim has to say about how 2020 has been a great year for Swift on the server, and we're definitely heading in the right direction. Moving on, I want to talk about remote work. Many of you uh, probably have seen uh, companies like Twitter, Square, Coinbase, many Silicon Valley companies are saying like remote work forever. I know Facebook has put out a big push for remote work recently. So uh, a lot of talk and chatter on Twitter is how is that going to affect software developers, right? Like, you know, are you still going to make your expensive, crazy San Francisco, Silicon Valley salary? if you're living in rural America or, or some other part of the, the world where cost of living is much cheaper, or, or are these big companies gonna start paying engineers less? So nobody really knows the answer and like what's gonna happen. A lot of people have their hot take on it, um, but you know my take on it is nobody knows. It's gonna be very interesting to see how this plays out over the next couple of years. However, I'm gonna share some tweets that do share some perspectives on it. And I wanna put this out there because I wanna hear in the comments, like, what do you think? Because again, I'll say, I don't think anybody knows, but I'm sure everybody has an opinion and I'm curious, you know, what people think about this. So I'm gonna share kind of three perspectives that are summed up in these tweets. And, and again, I would love to hear what you think. I'll give my opinion just because why not? But I will say that it is a very loosely held opinion. Like, I don't know, but if you're gonna force me to pick one of these, I'll tell you which one I'll pick. So we'll start off with this middle tweet from Nikita. It says, to everyone wanting to keep their San Francisco salary when they move to Montana, don't worry, when the talent pool is global, we'll all get paid 10% of what we formerly did. Everything will be fair again. I don't know if that's uh, sarcasm or what, but anyway, that was uh, that take. And then here, uh, Adam responded uh, with his take, nope, you want the $200 an hour engineer, not the $20 an hour one, whether it's in the Bay Area, Bangladesh, you know, doesn't matter. Uh, the person charging $200 is who you want to hire. Anyone who thinks otherwise hasn't spent weekends of their lives fixing work done poorly. Don't worry, you'll get there eventually. So that's another take. Uh, and then this bottom take is kind of where I lean, and I'll tell you more about that. Uh, it says, the top will be fine, the bottom will be fine, but the middle will get slaughtered. And honestly, sometimes, uh, that, that part, is, whatever, that second line, but that, that, that top line, the top is going to be okay. The top engineers, they're probably going to be fine. Nothing's going to change. But the bottom, that's probably not going to change either. However, that middle, I do, this is what kind of where I lean, is I do think that middle uh, is going to uh, be in for some, some hurt. So, but again, I will say, I don't know. Nobody knows what's going to happen. It's going to be very interesting to see how it plays out. If you force me to pick which one of these I thought, which, you know, was, here's the options, right? Everyone's just going to get paid a hell of a lot less. It's, it's going to affect everybody. I don't think that's going to happen. I do believe, uh, you know, the top engineers are going to be perfectly fine, which is kind of what Adam is saying here. Uh, and then here we live to serve. I don't know. It says the top will be fine. Bottom will be fine. The middle, the kind of like middling engineers are who's going to feel the effect of this. And that's kind of how I lean. But again, 
very loosely held. I, I just, I'm curious how all this is going to play out. I think one thing is for sure, uh, our industry is going to change. How? We'll see. Next, we have an article from Brent Simmons talking about the, uh, the ideal iPhone app first run experience is none at all. And really, this is all about your onboarding. And I wanted to talk about this because I think a lot of developers just default into this, eh, just throw some onboarding screens at them, telling them how to use the app. And what Brent is saying, and I agree with, is that's probably not the answer. Uh, as he says, you know, uh, they've already waited to see your app. They're excited to see what it's like and get started and use it. And now that it's here, you put a bunch of obstacles in their way. In their way. You know what I'm talking about, right? Those like four or five swipeable onboard screens that 90% of users just go swipe, 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 swipe. And here's what he says, right? When I download an app for the first run tutorial, I try to find a way to short circuit it and get to the actual app. If I can, I just race through it, knowing that I wouldn't have remembered any of it anyway. That's the key. You can data dump everything your user is gonna know, they're not gonna remember it. They don't have the context of how your app works. So giving them all that information up front is like, eh. Uh, and then here's a key line. Either I can figure out the app later or I can't. Uh, kind of going back to like how apps should be very, very simple uh, to use. And down here, I think really sums it up uh, nicely. Here, we'll go to the bottom. Uh, remember that every single thing in your app sends a message. A first run tutorial sends the message that your app has a steep learning curve. Like that's definitely a turnoff. Right? If the first experience your user has after they download this app is this really long, complex tutorial or a bunch of information, it just leaves it. It provokes anxiety in the user immediately in two uh, ways. Will I ever be able to learn this apparently hard to use app? Uh, will I remember any of this tutorial at all? Do I need to be taking notes? Right? It's, it, it, I do agree, it sends the wrong message, right? And that's the first impression. We all know how powerful first impressions are. So uh, keep that in mind when you're building your apps and your onboarding. Like I said, it's very easy for developers to just default into, ah, eh, just throw some onboarding screens to tell them how to use the app. Uh, just think twice about that next time. Moving on, we have an article from Ben Sandofsky of Halide, uh, or more, you know, the parent company Lux here. Uh, year three, the end of the beginning. And essentially what this is, is if you're not familiar with Halide, it's a very popular indie camera app on the App Store. And what this article is, is just a summary of their year. And I love this stuff, maybe because I'm just super interested in like, indie app development, running a small startup. Like I just, I just love this stuff. Uh, so this is basically a summary of their year and their year is highlighted, right? Spectre, uh, one of their apps uh, was Apple's 2019 iPhone app of the year. Kind of a big deal, right? So uh, he talks about all about how that happened, uh, how they have to manage their time and all that stuff, how, uh, you know, they, they had a lost update in Spectre that they didn't get to. It's basically just a very transparent, um, summary of how their year went. And I want to get to a, uh, a good line here that I like where it talks about, okay, here's how they got the email uh, from Apple. I have an opportunity I'd like to talk to you about. I think you'll find interesting. It's when they found out Spectre was the 2019 uh, app of the year. But uh, and there's more about, about Spectre. That's what it looks like, by the way. It takes nice like ghost trail videos. I'm probably doing that long exposure. <laughs> it's right there. That's what I meant. Um, like this kind of stuff. But uh, anyway, this is the line uh, that I wanted to really show off here. Uh, because I think it really sums up running a small business around your um, your app or, or small startup. I shouldn't say small business. I have no idea how much revenue they make. But uh, I love this, though. There's a million things we want to do, but the Lost Spectre update was a warning sign that we were bumping up against our limits. They're just a two-person shop. Two people can only do so much, right? So in the last year, it felt like we've had to weigh the opportunity cost of everything, right? Does it make sense to spend two weeks building a demo for the iPhone app of the year. Like, of course that does, right? Should we spend a few days writing this post? You know, a few days doesn't feel like a lot, but all your work grinds to a halt when you're just a, a small shop. So they're talking about how they're getting up to the point where, where they need to hire people. They're talking about their first hire in Rebecca Slatkin down here. Well, real quick, you can see like this was the sales bump from their uh, iPhone app of the year feature. Obviously did pretty well there. Uh, but anyway, again, just a, uh, this is kind of a halide specter. This is like their, their suite of apps here if you want to check those out. But uh, they've been playing around with the LiDAR on the new iPads to see if they can use that for future, you know, uh, camera stuff. So again, I've said it a couple of times now, but it's just a summary of a small indie app developer. And I say small just because they have two employees. Again, I have no idea how much revenue they make. Um, you know, they made their first hire in Rebecca Slatkin, another well-known developer. But like I said, I just love... Uh, hearing these stories about how businesses are run, especially around app development and especially with small teams. So if you're into that kind of thing, I think you're really gonna enjoy this article. Check it out. Next, we have a conference app builders has released their videos. Now, of course, this is normally an in-person conference. 
nowadays we can't be doing that kind of stuff uh, but they have released all their presentations on YouTube I'll link to it in the description go check them out uh, you have things like UI testing over the years from Peter Steinberger uh, you know uh, custom UI components in Swift UI, Chris Eidoff, uh, Paul Hudson gets interviewed. Uh, a lot of good stuff here, getting started with Combine. So uh, definitely check out these videos. Uh, I mean, you can see all the topics here. If you're interested in any of these topics, you know, check it out. And then we have another Twitter thread I want to share with you because I know I get a lot of questions about people thinking they're too old to learn to code. And I get this question from some people that are as young as 23, 24, and they still think they're too old. Um, so of course here, Casey says, hi, John Sundell, I'm 38 and just started learning Swift and worried I may be too old or too far behind to make it as an iOS developer. Is it too late for me? And the reason I even know about this is because John pulled me in here, uh, as you can see. And then what I wanna share with you is just the read through the thread, all the replies, especially if you are I don't know how, I don't care how old you are. If you feel like you're too old or you're just getting started learning and you may be worried about that, definitely read through this thread because a lot of people sharing their stories about how they started coding at an older age, if you will, and uh, kind of all their stories, how they handled it. So if you feel like that's you, definitely check out the thread, link in the description. Uh, I think you'll feel better after reading it. And then finally, we have a tool called Black Illustrations. And as you see, it's diverse illustrations of people of color. Now, I work with a lot of stock, uh, you know, iconography or, or, or illustrations like this. Uh, the B-roll I use for my videos is all stock B-roll that I pay a subscription for. And, you know, you want to show representation in your content and all that stuff. But when you're at the mercy of the limitations of, you know, the B-roll provider or the stock illustration provider, you know, there's only so much you can choose. So this is a great tool, free to download of just uh, illustration showing people of color in your work. And I'm gonna scroll through here. You can see some of the examples. Uh, so you have, you know, you see how it could be potentially used in an app uh, on a website. So uh, it's just a great way to show that representation within your app, you know, in the assets of it. So uh, check it out again, free to download. It's called Black Illustrations. As always, link is in the description. That's gonna wrap up this episode of Swift News. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you two Mondays from now because now Swift News is every other Monday. Catch you in the next one.